So it's been saying it's proving very difficult to trace these drones, their operators. Um, can you give us a bit more of an idea of what kind of range these drones uh, operate uh, on? Well, it really depends on the, the type of drone that's in use. And it's, it's worth pointing out that I think still at the moment, the authorities are unsure of, of what type of drone is actually being, being used, be it the, uh, a commercial off-the-shelf drone that we see every day that potentially a hobbyist might use to the more commercial drones or even a, a bespoke uh, home build uh, drone. But uh, effectively, the capabilities of, of commercial drones have been rapidly developing over uh, the last few years. Uh, and it's been quite a transformation. But essentially, you, you can get uh, certainly a number of kilometers uh, of control distance between the, the, the controller and the drone itself which will make it all the more difficult, obviously, to find the perpetrators of this. Um, but can, they, they could have catastrophic consequences, couldn't they, should they hit an aeroplane? The, the, there's been some research into the, the potential problems of that, yes. And, um, and I think this goes back to the point that uh, Mr Baldoni was, was mentioning in terms of the, the potential registration and legislation around this. Uh, our point uh, of view is that legislation is, is, is welcomed in this young sector for drones. And, and we are very much behind the adoption of uh, drone technology. But as with all technology like computers, etc., there's going to be those that wish to use it for uh, other purposes um, and um, essentially uh, what we're looking at here is um, a very sustained and, and deliberate act of, of disrupting the flights and, here and at Gatwick. They could, they could potentially bring down the plane, could they, if a drone was to hit, hit a plane? Um, it really depends on, uh, on, the, um, on the approaching speeds. Uh, really, of, of, of the drones. Um, they're obviously a threat. They're obviously a real threat that the, that the government is taking seriously. And um, uh, th there is a possibility. Uh, of course, it'd be much alike to a, a bird strike. Well, this is exactly what well, was my next question. Now, there, there are, there's a lot of discussion about how to stop these drones. And just briefly now, but we're hearing possibilities of shooting down the drones, but even also birds being used to stop them. <laughs> Yes, I mean, the, the issue we see with, with shooting down is um, the, the, the collateral impact uh, of, of potentially not hitting the target. We're talking something, uh, we're talking of a drone, something the size of a, of a dinner plate, uh, moving at speed, highly maneuverable, um, and um, th uh, therefore it makes it rather hard to actually shoot down with any kind of projectile, be it a bullet or whatever. Uh, the Netherlands has tried... Uh, uh, um, birds to, to, to capture this, but that's been proven uh, unsuccessful. Our, our, uh, our view is that um, we, we look at the major technology that's actually being used by the drone itself, which is the radio frequency that transmits the, the video and imagery from the drone to the controller. And that's where we've uh, seen the, the most effective uh, way of, of combating the uh, encroachment of, of uh, drones into, uh, into, into airspace. 13 people are believed to have died in the Czech Republic after a methane explosion at a coal mine in the east of the country. A number of others were injured in the blast, which devastated underground work areas. Rescue efforts have been hampered by poor visibility. It is unknown whether most of the mostly Polish workforce were hurt. We take you to Moscow now, where Vladimir Putin has accused Ukraine of provoking the Azov Sea incidents while speaking to great fanfare at his end-of-year press conference. The Azov Sea was just one of the topics addressed by the Russian president in his four-hour Q&A, while correspondent Galina Polonskaya asked him about the fallout from the latest dispute with Ukraine. The UN adopted a resolution on Russia's militarization of the Sea of Azov, Crimea, and a part of the Black Sea. After what happened to the Ukrainian ships in the Kursh Strait, there have been reports that Russia is supplying military equipment to Crimea. Why does Russia want a military buildup in Crimea? And is Russia ready to declare the whole naval area as its territory? 
This was deliberate provocation as part of the election campaign of Mr. Poroshenko. As we already showed through the media, we ordered that we be shown the ship's journal, and it said to pass covertly. What does that mean? It means no one knowing that it's going to happen. And those who conduct the orchestra in Kiev, those who set the tune, they talk about the fact that they are actually ready to blow the bridge up. We can't allow that to happen. As for the Sea of Azov regime, we have had a treaty since 2003, and it states that the shore area of five kilometers, not the 12 nautical miles in keeping with international standards, but five kilometers from the shore, these are the territorial waters of the state, be it Russia or Ukraine, and the rest of the sea is common to both countries. And when our fishermen were seized, they were actually seized in those neutral waters. They were not entering territorial waters. And they still haven't been released, including the captain. And Euronews stays quiet about that, as if it's common practice. The same was the case with other sailors, including the crew of a cargo ship. The whole crew is detained and nobody is even talking about it. We are ready to stick to our agreements and we are not taking any unilateral measures.